There you go. Good morning. I want to walk you in the name of Jesus Christ. We are so glad that you are here on this fourth Sunday of Easter tide, and uh, it's also Mother's Day. And and uh, uh, as usual, I don't really have a Mother's Day service because uh, this day is fraught with a lot of emotions for you that have had children or have great mothers. It's a it's a joyful day, but for us who have not had great mothers or have lost children or uh, can't uh, get pregnant or or, or single, or whatever, uh, we lose that. There's this fraught with lots and lots of emotion. So I just want to say that for me, the biggest thing about today is it's about all the women in my life. So many of you in this congregation have been like my mother. Uh, you have cared for me and loved for me and disciplined me. No, you didn't spank me, but I know there's some. I know there was times that some of you wanted to spank me, right? So uh, I probably deserved it. Uh, but so I just want to say uh, thank you for all the women who uh, share their faith and their love uh, and their and their consistency with all of us, whether you're single uh, or lost a child or uh, or have wonderful kids. Uh, this day is is for you. Uh, and every day actually should be for you for as much as you do. So I want to give you uh, glory and honor and praise uh, this day. Um, this is also another important day. This is the very first Sunday of a new sermon series. So I know you guys are excited about that. And, and you should be. Uh, and so I'm not going to uh, run it, but you can kind of look at our graphic today. Maybe you could figure, figure it out what we're going to do. Uh, but I do want you to mark on your calendar uh, Pentecost, June 5th. Pentecost, June 5th. That's going to be a huge day in the life of this congregation if you all do what I tell you. So you pay attention to my sermon, you'll find out what you need to do uh, on this day. Any other announcements we need to lift up to the good of our, our church family? Well, if not, Christ is, risen. Christ is risen. Let us devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching, his, their prayers, their passionate worship, as we prepare for worship with glad and generous hearts.
hear the psalmist sing, How beautiful are the places where you dwell, O Lord! This house cannot contain your glory. Even the heavens are bursting with the goodness of your presence. Let us stand and proclaim God's praises to all the earth in our call to worship. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. God, we come to worship you. In spirit and truth. We come to empty ourselves for you. Receive our praise and worship, our joys and sorrows, our hopes and fears. We give all ourselves to you in worship. So that you will fill us up with your spirit and send us out into your world again to continue the work of your kingdom. Praise God. Praise God. Praise, Praise God. God. Day by day, God wants to lead us to places of hope and healing so we might bear fruit. While moment by moment, we continue to follow sin down all the wrong paths and end up isolated and often broken people. So let us entrust 
our brokenness to the one who can restore us to wholeness so we might be a fruitful congregation. Join me in prayer. God, our shepherd and ruler, you give us life and provide for us all that we need. You are worthy of our praise. Why is it so hard to trust in your grace, gracious God? When we stray from your ways and worship other gods, you find us and bring us back. Teach us to passionately worship you alone and listen only for your voice. Guide us in the teachings of your apostles who passionately devoted themselves to breaking bread and prayers. Forgive us when we isolate ourselves and put a lock on our hearts and feelings while you share your precious child with us. Forgive us and anoint us with the oil of grace until our art overflow with praise. Creator vine grower, and graft us to the true vine so we might bear fruit, dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. Amen. <clears throat> morning our comforter leads us to a place spread with forgiveness and overflowing grace a fruitful community filled with life and love and friendships friends hear the good news Easter does continue for Christ lives in us and he came so that we might not only just be forgiven but that we could lead an abundant life thanks be to God Amen. Today, Paul talks about chosen people, God's chosen people, where love binds them all together in perfect unity. While Luke, we hear this morning, talks about community meld together in their daily life. Both are visions of the church where everyone passionately worships and shares their blessings. Let us do the same by greeting one another in the peace and unity of Jesus Christ. The peace of Christ be with you all.
part of the being a fruitful congregation is is knowing each other and sharing with each other, um, even though it's not on our list here, it's for pray, praying for one, one another. And so we work our way through our church directory like we do every week. Remember John Wittenborn, and uh, John, if you're watching this, we miss you. Uh, hope to see you soon. We also remember the York family. We remember Paul and Paul. Uh, Paul's gone. Um, so, uh, so we're not going to pray for Paul, but Dara, we'll remember Dara and their son Jacob. So, and we'll continue to pray for Paul. <laughs> there he is. And uh, then we also remember the Ziesmer family, uh, uh, Dennis and Karen. And uh, so we're so grateful for all these people that do so much to make our church uh, fruitful and, uh, and it's a great place to be. Church we're praying for words is uh, there in New Horizon Presbyterian Church in Overland, Missouri. So remember them and their pastor, uh, Jeannie uh, Zimmerman. So remember her and their active ministry. Um, so again, I, I want to lift up all the women in our church, uh, just not our mothers, but all the women. And at the very end of the service, there's a video dedicated to uh, all the women uh, in, in the world, uh, probably if we want to think of that way too, but especially for you that are part of our congregation. And what the joy that Margaret and I have is uh, yesterday, Bethany uh, had graduation. She got an uh, education specialist degree from Lindenwood and uh, her specialty is in uh, leadership. So is that, I got that right? Uh, I think it's in lead, yeah, lead, leadership. And so we, uh, we attended one more, I attended one more Lindenwood graduation. I'm probably my last one ever, uh, may, maybe, but probably not, right? So, uh, but we're grateful for that. Any other joys and concerns that we have as a people of God? Jake, Jacob, is, I can pray about that? I can pray about that? Yeah, I, and I've, I mean, I've been praying for you, Jacob, but I'm saying I, I didn't know I could publicly say that. Uh, Jacob had surgery again on his shoulder this last week, and he's recovering, and so he has about three to four months of, of rehab. And so I'm going to be his personal trainer this time. No? No. Dang it. Go to yoga. That's what I do. Yoga will do it. So, so remember Jacob. Any other joys and concerns that we have a people of God? Seeing none, let's continue in prayer. On this fourth Sunday of Easter is a scent of Easter flowers, not yet a distant memory. Hold your resurrection glory before us as our guide and our hope, O oh God. May this season plant seeds of new life and yield fruit in Christ that we might have glad and generous hearts. Day by day, your living water is poured into the aridness of our souls, and you share your joy so we might bear fruit and share our blessings to those around us. Oh God, we pray that you may never forsake the means of grace that you've granted to us. Keep us true to the way of prayer, to the reading of Scripture, to the practice of gathering in your name with passion. Build in us and your church everywhere devotion to the teachings of the apostles and lead us to live fruit-filled lives so that your light might shine through us and draw those around us closer to you. Bless this congregation to be a fruitful congregation so that we might be a blessing in our community and the world around us. Lord, settle our hearts and our minds Lift from us our burdens and hear our prayers for our family, our friends, our chaotic world, and for our own lives. We give you thanks for the mothers among us and ask you to strengthen them in their daily task. Grant them wisdom in the lessons they teach, patience in the discipline they foster, and sacrifice in their family devotion. May they be given honor and thanks they deserve, but often do not receive. And we thank you for all motherly figures, grandmothers and aunts and sisters and wives and stepmothers and foster mothers and babysitters and teachers and health care providers and neighbors and friends and loved ones and so many others who have practiced self-sacrifice and embody compassion to all who are privileged to be in their influence. Grant them a special blessing for their faithful love, knowing that they've made a huge impact 
on those that they have loved. We also remember this morning those that we've shared with our lips and those who are on the silence of our hearts. Lord, hear our prayer. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor are yours, O God. We open our hearts now up to you, even as we pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It is good to be here in your presence, Lord. Here we are at home with each other and with you. Here by our passionate worship and the power of your holy word read and shared, we discover the joy of life and the strength to live each day with praise in our hearts to you. You alone are God and can show us the way to the life that lasts forever. We lift this prayer in adoration of your holy name. Amen. Our first New Testament lesson on this fourth Sunday of Easter is from Paul's letter to a new and growing church in Colossae. Let us join these first converts to faith as we listen to Paul's instructions about passionate worship from Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. God loves you and has chosen you as his own special people. So be gentle, kind, humble, meek and patient. Put up with each other and forgive anyone who does you wrong, just as Christ has forgiven you. Love is more important than anything else. It is what ties everything completely together. Each one of you is part of the body of Christ, and you were chosen to live together in peace. So let the peace that comes from Christ control your thoughts and be grateful. Let the message about Christ completely fill your lives while you use all your wisdom to teach and instruct each other. With thankful hearts, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. Whatever you say or do should be done in the name of the Lord Jesus as you give thanks to God the Father because of him. Friends, may our thankful hearts and practice of passionate worship of God's own special people help us be a fruitful congregation. Amen. Amen. Children, please come forward. What's up, Kevin? Really? So, is everybody's mother here today? You know, your mom's not here today. Oh, let's say that that's a good that's a good Mother's Day gift. Send you away and and uh, with Jeff and and uh, let her have some time. So, point stand up and point to your mother. Where's your mom? She's in the back, way in the back. All the good mothers are in the back. It looks like, uh, but guess what? Point to Carolyn right there and Margaret and Sue, right? All that. That's that's your mother. And over here, over here, Judy's your mother, and Joe's your mother. Uh huh. Yes, and Jenny here, and Ruth, and Angie. These all are your mothers. They are your mother. These are women in the church that love you and care for you, and will always be there. And when you were baptized, if you were baptized here, they all stood up and said they're going to help raise you. They did. They're going to take care of you. And that's important because I tell you what, you're not always going to be around your, your mothers in the back. Yeah, you're not always going to be there. And Margaret and I, we haven't been around. Margaret's mom passed away a long time ago. 
And we've lived away. I moved away when I was 16 and then, then again forever after 18. And I've never been back home. And so what these all ladies like this are the ones that made me know what a mother is. And they've loved me and cared for me. You, I would be the biggest mess if it wasn't for the women in the church that took care of me. And you think I'm a mess now. You could get, I'd be even way worse. So remember that. So when you see anybody, you should hug them and say Happy Mother's Day to any woman that, that's in your life. From it's a teacher or a nurse or a doctor or a dentist or, I mean, anyone. You're a school bus driver. If they, does anybody do school buses anymore and ride that? They'd still have those things, right? Or counselors, all those people, okay? It's an important day that we thank God for all the women and our lives, right? That's important. So it takes a village. It's an African prov uh, proverb. It takes a village to raise a children. And some of you needs more than one village. That's I got to say. I'm not looking at Kevin or anything. So sorry. So okay. Let's. So go back when you go by every woman. Either hug them or say hap uh, happy Mother's Day. Okay. Do that to every woman you see on the way back. Or young. No, you can't close your eyes and walk by. Well, you'll run into something. Don't do that. One of our New Testament lessons today comes to us from, it's kind of a, it's a weird book. I don't know if it's a, I, we treat it like a gospel. It's not a letter, um, but it follows the gospel of Luke. It's uh, Acts, book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. And uh, this is actually talks about the very first converts, very new church that we're developing in the time right after Christ. And so we're going to turn, turn to Acts 2, 2 through 47. And hear the word of God. These new converts, new Christians, new followers of the way called Jesus, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. All came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any of them had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. My friends, these exciting words of the new and emerging church is at the heart of who Jesus is in the gospel of his good news message. And the people of God said, thanks be to God. <clears throat> Let us pray. God of grace, on this fourth Sunday of Easter, we come to you filled with stories of Christ's love. 
We look to the image of the early Christians, some of whom experienced Jesus' ministry. Others simply heard about his love for all. So open us up all this morning to receive fresh meaning from these ancient stories so that we could share our lives with one another in worship, gladness, and generous and grateful hearts. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> A little boy came home from his very first Sunday school class, and his mom asked him who his teacher was. And the little boy answered, I don't remember her name, but she, she was really, really nice. Oh, yeah, she must have been Jesus' grandmother because, or something because that's all she wanted to talk about. It's obvious that this woman was a devoted teacher and a passionate follower of Jesus, right? The question this story and this morning's scriptures, all of it, ask of us is, are we, of, are we as devoted? Do our words and our actions reflect our passionate love for Jesus? Our various Bible lessons this morning are, are actually living snapshots of the life of the early developing faith communities that eventually became the church. You see, these passages reveal what was central to their lives and the character of their discipleship. Uh, the passages say and allude to the fact that they were devoted and they were also passionate. But maybe we should stop right now and ask to ourselves, to what? To what were they passionate about? A man by the name of Jim Dunn was serving the pastor of First Presbyterian Church and his wife Gladys was Super friendly, just like my wife, Margaret. And like Margaret, she understood how important it is to make people feel welcome at church. So she was always trying to talk to as many people as she can before the service and after the service. One particular Sunday worship lasted a lot longer than usual, just like I do on occasion. Occasion, on occasion. In fact, it lasted so long that some people were beginning to look at their watches and they were fidgeting in their seats. And of course, there were some that actually left and a few who fell asleep. And after the service, Gladys, the pastor's wife, was busy visiting everyone she could. And she noticed this visitor with his head down. This guy had fallen asleep, so she walked over to this elderly gentleman and noticed that on his lap was a hearing aid that he was trying to adjust. So she loudly, uh, loudly came over to him and says, Hello, I'm glad it's done. And the man immediately looked up and said, Yeah, I'm glad he's done too. I don't think he's ever going to quit. <laughs> Why are you guys laughing? I, I'm taking this personally. I don't understand this. This morning, we're beginning a five-week sermon series focusing on being a fruitful congregation. This sermon series begins, began with this idea when Paul and Dave Wicks and I met as part of our church membership and hospitality committee, where we began talking about an evangelism conference I attended a couple of years ago called Shift 2.0, and I shared with them how I was struck by a couple of things that Phil Maynard taught. And the first that he taught that caught my eye was uh, in ear, says how churches need to shift from this ideal of evangelism to radical hospitality. And secondly, for the church to be the church, we need to shift from membership to discipleship. It was a really fruitful conversation, and we began to uh, make a commitment to read Dr. Maynard's book called Shift 2.0, Helping Congregations Back into the Game of Effective Ministry. As we begin and hope to begin to shift from fellowship to radical hospitality, shift from worship of an event to worship as a lifestyle, from serve us to serve us, to service, from survival mentality, which we have here, to actually being a church of generosity. And then shortly after this meeting, serendipitously, Margaret loves that word, I began to uh, uh, read an article that caught my eye called, In Ministry Matters, said, Five Practices of 
fruitful congregations. And the article began with the preface from the book with the same title that read, Radical Hospitality, Passionate Worship, Intentional Faith Development, Risk-Taking Mission and Service, Extravagant Generosity. People are searching for church shaped and sustained by these qualities. The presence and strength of these five practices demonstrate a congregation's health, vitality, and fruitfulness. By repeating and improving these practices, churches fulfill the mission to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. This article had me at radical. So after reading this article and reflecting on our recent membership and hospitality committee conversation, I'm actually smart enough to realize that God was calling me to preach a sermon series on how we can be a fruitful congregation and shift into effective ministry. And so each week I'm going to preach on these points, fish, finishing up at the very end on Radical Hospitality Sunday. If you don't like that, Paul wants to call it Friendship Sunday. But as good Presbyterians, there's also a thing called Mr. Rogers Day Sunday. And so we're going to have a Mr. Rogers Day Sunday, all coming together on Pentecost Sunday, June 5th. So won't you be a neighbor and ask your neighbors? Won't you be a friend and ask a friend? Won't you be radical in your hospitality and ask someone you know to come to this wonderful church that we call St. Charles Presbyterian Church? It's Paul, Dave, and my hope and prayer that the insights that we hear in our scriptures during these weeks and the lessons that I share will challenge us to ask some very important and some very tough questions about this our church, to actually begin to venture into the waters of reformation, to explore scripture, to think, to question, to discern, to share, to talk, and hopefully as a result we'll be a little bit closer answering that question, what is it that we're devoted to? What are we passionate about that helps us be a fruitful congregation that makes a difference in our lives in our community's lives. In some ways, these books have a very, very difficult premise about how the church today needs to change the very core of its being, and that really scares me. But at the same time, as I've read these books, the principles of these books are extraordinarily simple. If I were actually trying to sum up the entirety of these two books into three simple words, that would be, be the church. Be the church. In other words, be the active living body of Jesus Christ. We're going to be spending these next five weeks learning about what that means. Not that any one of these practices or shifts is more important to the others. Like the illustration I started with, you could be radically hospitable, but what good is that if worship is long and dull, right? My hope is that these sermons will spark some interest. My, my hope is that these sermons will spark some conversations. My hope is that these sermons will spark some ideas that will help us shift into the unknown future so we can begin to bear the fruit that feeds people's deepest needs. You see, I'm convinced. In fact, I absolutely know without a shadow of a doubt that people are starving for answers to life's problems. Others are dying from spiritual starvation, and yet they never look to the God's guidebook to life. They never attend or even think about attending a worship service to soak up the very presence of God's love. And what our scripture passages this morning teaches us is that the early church devoted them, themselves to this very effort. And that's why they gathered together, bound in love, letting the word of Christ dwell deeply and richly in them. And they taught each other all wisdom, and they, they sang psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in their hearts to God. In other words, they practice radical, passionate worship. So what does passionate worship look like? 
A small town Christian went to a large city one weekend and attended one of those big box city churches. And he came home and his wife asked him, well, how was it? And he said, well, it was okay. They did lots of things different. And she said, well, what, like what? And well, they sang praise songs instead of hymns. And she said, praise songs? Well, what are those? Well, and he said, well, they're, they're like hymns, only, only different. She said, well, well what's the difference? And the man said, well, it's like this. If I were to say you, Martha, the cows are in the corn... And I describe it theologically and exactly how and why they got into the pen and where God was and all that. Well, that would be a hymn. On the hand, other hand, if I would say to you, Martha, 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 oh, Martha, 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 the cows, the big cows, the brown cows, the black cows, the white cows, the black and white cows, the cows, the cows are in the corn, or in the corn, in the corn, or in the corn, or in the corn, or they're in the corn, or in the corn, or in the corn. Now repeat that seven times. That's a praise hymn. A new Christian from the very same city came and visited relatives of this guy's small town one weekend, and he intended that mainline church. And he came home, and his wife says, well, how was it? He says, well, this young man said it was okay, but they do some things differently than us. And she says, well, what are those things? Well, they, they sing, uh, you know, hymns instead of praise songs. And she says, hymns? Well, what are those? Oh, they're like praise songs, only different. She says, well, what's the difference? She said, well, it's like this. If I were to say, Martha, the cows are in the corn, and I, and I repeated that a few times, well, that's a praise song. On the other hand, if I would say, oh, Martha, dear Martha, hear thou glorious truth, for the ways of the animals is terribly uncouth. They're in their heads, there's no shadow of sins. They sneak into my corn unless they are fenced. So look at that bright shining day by and by where no hungry animals makes my soul cry. Where all good things on earth are reborn and I no longer see those foul cows in my corn. Well, and I repeat that and I'd only do one, three, and four and do a key change in the last verse. That's a hymn. You could ask ten different people what passionate worship is. And I guarantee you, you're going to get 10 different answers. I mean, we can't even agree what worship is, less on what passionate worship might be. We have to label and categorize our worship experience so people can kind of pick and choose like they're shopping from some online Amazon thing on something that they think is a good one that's going to fit them. And that way they're not picking some other kind of drivel that has no place in their lives. What they want to think is a church. We call it contemporary church. We call it traditional church. We call it blues church. We call it evangelical worship. We call it half-calf, no-fat, no-whip latte worship church. You see, there is many churches made of classic Gothic theme with church spires like ours. Is there are metal buildings with no ch uh, cross on top. There are churches that follow Calvin's five classic movements in worship, just like we do in our worship every single week. Just look at your bulletin. And then there's actually churches that has no bulletins whatsoever. And I'm not even going to talk about organ versus drums and guitar music. It makes me ask that very fundamental question in the midst of all these different kinds of worship. What form is right? What venue is right? Which worship service truly glorifies God and can be considered authentic, passionate worship? Now for those of us in a Presbyterian church, this word passionate and worship being linked together makes us just a little bit uncomfortable, right? You see us spiritual descendants of John Calvin are known for our intellectual bent, not our warm and emotional fuzzy side, right? That's why Presbyterians are frequently called God's frozen chosen. I hate, and that cannot be a strong enough word, I hate that term because I am anything but frozen and chosen in how I love Jesus Christ and the way I do worship. And I have tried for over 30 years to fight this idea that the life of the mind and service of God is what characterizes us as Presbyterians. 
Too often, we, if we do get excited about something, it's actually over a, a single word or a phrase or a point of order. Man, do we love order as a Presbyterian church. Passion seems to, to too many of us this whole idea of emotionalism, and we think that somehow we're going to lose control of what happens on Sunday mornings. So this idea of passionate worship may actually begin to stretch us a little bit, especially when it's offered by these two Wesleyan scholars and, and uh, writers of these books whose traditional values about, talks about Wesley's warmed heart. Warmed heart. But here's the thing. Calvin, even though he's known as an intellect, with deep, deep, deep theological writings that may have never been overdone by anybody else, but he's one of the top, I think, ten ever in his theological writings. He was also a man of passion. Just look at Calvin's seal. It's a heart, not a brain, not a book. It's a heart. And notice he says this. This is his motto. My heart I offer to you, Lord, promptly and sincerely. That, my friends, is passion. I think one of the most insightful things about Calvin's passion actually is the fact that when he died, he left orders to be buried without a tombstone. There was no gaudy funeral no flower eulogy. It simply was this. The Geneva Register simply recorded four days after his death, Calvin went to be with God May 27th of the present year. Calvinist pastor and theologian Joel Beek reflects, shaping this longing for obscurity was Calvin's sincere desire that only God be glorified. Only God be be glorified. Now, if that isn't passionate worship, I don't know what is. Our scripture text for today does not provide a definition of worship so much as it provides us nuances of the characters of worship. Paul describes worship in his letter to Colossians that we heard this way. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God. In its very subtext is a message that we need to hear. Worship is worship. We could ask Paul right now, what kind of music better glorifies God? And he would respond, what? What are you talking about? No, 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 no. When you sing, whatever you do, do it with gratitude in your hearts. And that's the key. It isn't about the kind of songs we sing. It's about how we sing and who we sing those songs to. Are we doing it out of gratitude to God, or are we doing it just to feel good about ourselves? And that point makes all the difference in the world. You see, worship is defined by our attitude that we bring. It's not a gothic building versus a metal building. It's not a bulletin versus a, a PowerPoint, a screen. It's defined by whether or not we're prepared to glorify Him and worshiping Him and Him alone. How do we define worship? Well, that's simple. Worship that worships God. And passionate worship draws people to Christ. And it affords people the opportunity to be shaped by God. You see, we aren't here at worship merely to observe, to evaluate, to rate, whether that's a one or a ten sermon, whether that's a one or a ten song, about whether we like the length of our service or not. We're here only for one, to receive whatever it is that God wants to give us on this particular day. Howard, you are not the audience. You're the participant. You all are not the audience. You are the one leading worship, not me. I'm just directing it, and you all are doing it. You are the worshiping community. 
The biggest danger to worship is not the kind of worship we have. No, the biggest danger to worship is we forget it's not about us. It's all about him. Worship isn't about us. It's about God. And the best part of it all is that if we truly place our focus on God, our worship then becomes vital to our lives, becomes vibrant, dare I say, it becomes passionate. What makes worship passionate is that worship points to God through His Son, Jesus Christ, and allows us to know Him, understand Him, and worship Him more fully. And haven't we found that to be true? Don't the sermons you remember the most have some truth about God that makes you cling to it? Some message that you carry out with you? Some point that makes you say that, hey, yes, this is God's Word and truth for me, just for me. You want passionate worship? That's easy. Let the word of Christ fill your heart till it actually begins to burst. Let the joy of God fill you so abundantly that people said, man, no person deserves that much joy. Worship God so passionately that the peace and understanding of God overflows your very being. And come to worship with that kind of attitude and you, it won't just change your experience of worship. It will actually change your very life for the better. In the five practices of fruitful congregation, Robert Schnace writes, God in Christ changes people's lives through passionate worship. Worship stirs people's souls. It inspires them. It strengthens them. They find such help and courage and belonging and care that they cannot help but talk about the sermons, these ideas, or stories of music and prayers throughout the rest of the next week. And what this tells me is why I'm so passionate about worship. You see, I am firmly convinced and believe that the church offers the world in worship every Sunday cannot be found and had any where else you can't get it at the beach it can't be obtained on the golf course it can't be had while you're hunting or fishing or hiking neither can be found in drinking coffee on sunday morning enjoying your family the good news of jesus makes all the difference in the world and we believers need to offer ourselves wholly and completely God on sunday morning right here within these walls. Whether we lift our songs with an organ or a guitar, whether we worship God in a church full of stained glass or steel buildings with no windows, we need to worship in deep gratitude toward God in such a way when we leave these walls, God's message goes out with us. And it carries us throughout the week. It allows us to grow and to learn so that our life experiences, just like our worship experience, may become passionate for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us pray. God of abundance, of abundant life, open our eyes to the marvelous evidence of your presence among us. Open to our ears to the one who calls us by name, and unites us together in true abiding fellowship of sharing, a prayer, of passionate worship that leads to bearing fruit. We ask this all through Jesus Christ, our brother and our Lord. Amen.
The book of Acts tells us that the early Christians, as an act of passionate devotion to Christ, would sell their possessions and distribute the proceeds to any who had need. Let us remember that kind of communal giving as we proceed with our own giving today. What we put in the offering plate by the exit doors, mail into the church, or the gifts given online are signs of our passionate worship to God. Let us offer our all with glad and generous hearts. God for watching over us and for supplying our needs according to the abundance of your grace. Receive, we pray, these tithes and offerings as an act of our love, passionate devotion. May these gifts help us as a church to be your voice, calling all people to abundant life. Use them and us for the sake of your eternal glory to be a fruitful congregation. Amen.
Today is Mother's Day, and we want to acknowledge all the women we're blessed to know. We rejoice over you, for your strength, your wisdom, your strong love, and your beautiful faith. Whether today is a celebration for you or a day of quiet reflection and healing, we're thinking of all of you. If you gave birth this year to your first child, our joy overflows and we celebrate with you. If you adopted a child this year or became a foster parent, we rejoice with you and we want to honor you in your commitment to changing the lives of children. If you continue to struggle with infertility, we are hoping with you and holding your hand in prayer. If you are exhausted and feeling underappreciated for all you do for a house full of kids, we applaud you. We love you and we appreciate you more than you can ever imagine. And if you lost a child this year to death or miscarriage, we weep and mourn with you. And if your child is lost to addiction or to the world, we hurt with you and we join you in putting our hope in the one who brings prodigals home. If you live with painful memories of your mom, we pray that you will find in a spiritual mother all that you never had from a birth mom. And if you're one of those amazing spiritual moms, we thank you for stepping up and being there when others couldn't. If you're experiencing an empty nest for the first time this year, we walk with you in this new season and are excited about the next chapter God has planned for you. If you're single, we celebrate your strength, beauty, and individuality, and join with you in praying for the desires of your heart. If you're a single mom and wonder if you have the physical energy and financial resources to raise and provide for your child or children, we want to help you, and we will. And if you're pregnant for the first time, we prayerfully anticipate with you the joyful birth of a healthy child. And to all the special women on this Mother's Day, rest and delight in knowing that we are thankful for you and we celebrate each and every one of you. Christ has truly risen. Go now and devote yourselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and the prayers for all of God's people. And may all the blessings and promises of God go with you. May the Spirit lead you to abundant life. May the one who's worthy of our passionate worship bless us both now and forevermore. Amen. Sticky fingers. Mm -hmm. 